I'm a senior lecturer in public health at the Open University, and I'm also director of Reproduction, Sexualities and Health Research Group at the Open University. Um, and as you know, we're going to talk about abortion today. Let me just make sure I get this right. Okay. So this is the outline of the presentation that Fiona and I are going to make to you today. Um, but I think it's worthwhile at the start to actually point out that um, we're very well aware that this is a very controversial and challenging topic, and it's a topic that many people have strong views on. Um, and I certainly know that from a number of research studies, that this is also a very difficult topic for many women, and that includes women who have an abortion. Um, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't talk about it. It is an issue that affects many people, that needs debate, and it's important in this debate, I believe, to learn from research so that our debate is an evidence-based debate. Um, and this is one reason why these, this seminar is such a great opportunity to have that type of debate. So Fiona and I are basing our presentation on what we can learn from research. The current evidence-based, an ongoing program of work that we've been engaged in, and some recent pilot work with key informants and stakeholders. So what's going to happen is that I'm going to open up with looking a bit at the global and British context, and then Fiona is going to um, talk more on Northern Ireland. Okay, so this is the big picture. This is the global context, um, and this takes a, a snapshot of the world's abortion laws. Um, it's the most up-to-date snapshot we've got in this particular format. And it shows different grounds for abortion around the world. It's worth noting, when we look at the map, that there is some correlation between grounds being more or less restrictive. I mean, I hope everybody can see this icon key in the, in the corner. So there is some correlation between grounds being more or less restrictive and strengths of feeling and controversy around abortion. And also there is some correlation around with unsafe abortion between um, grounds being more, more restrictive. So I'm going to look at what that means in a little bit more detail. So most of the data that we have for global abortion is data from the World Health Organization, the WHO. Now the WHO gathers data on maternal and reproductive health internationally. It, situa it situates abortion within a maternal reproductive health context and it develops evidence-based briefings and policy globally. So just um, a couple of figures. Around 21 and a half million women every year experience an unsafe abortion worldwide. About 47,000 women die of unsafe abortions each year, and deaths due to unsafe abortion are approximately 13% of all maternal deaths. So the WHO's reproductive health strategy thus urges member states to achieve universal access to sexual and reproductive health care, um, and access to contraceptive services are part of that. But the research tells us that many women experiencing an unintended and unwanted pregnancy were using contraception. At the, time of becoming at the time of becoming pregnant. So contraception in and of itself is not enough to prevent unintended and unwanted motherhood. We also know that abortion is sometimes necessary for intended and wanted pregnancies. And in fact, the whole issue about what is intended and unattended is really very complex and, and is the subject of a, a lot of research. Finally, we know from the incidence of unsafe abortion worldwide, um, most often a response to abortion restrictions, that actually restrictive abortion laws do not prevent abortion or prevent harm to women, but they may increase maternal mortality, and they do push women to travel for abortion, and that's obviously a particular concern here. Um, it's also of concern to international organisations who look at these issues. So, 
One of the most important meetings was the Cairo Conference, when in 1994, delegates from more than 179 countries and 1,200 non-governmental organizations met in Cairo at the International Conference on Population and Development, and they agreed a program of action to improve sexual and reproductive health. Um, it's interesting in the light of the discussion we've just had is that Cairo also marked a major shift in approach with respect to incorporating um, universally recognized human rights, including women's ability to control their own fertility into the program of action. So beginning to think about this in terms of a human right. I'm just gonna to read to you the definition of reproductive health that um, emanated from the Cairo conference. Reproductive health is a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being, and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity in all matters relating to the reproductive system and to its functions and processes. Reproductive health therefore implies that women are able to have a satisfying and safe sex life and that they have the capability to reproduce and the freedom to decide if, when, and how often to do so. Um, this is often referred to as the WHO definition of reproductive health as well, but it's a definition that came from the Cairo Conference. And I think it's really important to point out that what underpins this type of de definition are also principles that help women to have children in the best possible circumstances for them and for their future children. Now, moving swiftly through to the British context. I'm not quite sure what time I started, but I think I've got another few minutes. Okay. So um, the British context was, is obviously of particular relevance to Northern Ireland. So the legal framework for abortion in England, Wales, and Scotland is the 1967 Abortion Act. This act was amended by the Human Fertilization and Embryology Act in 1990, and it permits abortion up to 24 weeks in specific circumstances, and you can see the circumstances on the slide. When these conditions are not met, the law on abortion is still governed by the 1861 Offences Against the Person Act, something that we sometimes forget about, but that still is a very relevant act in, um, in Britain. And what I also want to point out, um, which people often forget as well, is that in law, at no gestational point do women have the right to an abortion on request. Um, and in addition, abortions must be performed in a hospital or specially licensed clinic. So, to give you a picture of some of the current debates on legislative reform in England, Scotland and Wales, um, this could be a longer list. Uh, I've just picked out the ones that are attracting most attention at the moment. As I said right at the very beginning, abortion is a controversial topic. It's controversial in Britain also. It's an issue that's often debated, and it's subject to many research studies. And as I said before, it's also a difficult issue for many women, as I know from my own research. So these are the, some of the issues currently being discussed in the research literature. So I'm gonna finish by drawing your attention to some issues that seem to me to be of particular relevance to Northern Ireland. Um, first of all, thinking about the removal of abortion from the context of the 1861 Offences Against the Person Act. This is a Victorian piece of legislation that is certainly no longer fit for purpose in the 21st century. Um, and then I'm going to draw your attention to the question of the 1967 Act and Northern Ireland. And just to give you a brief glimpse into some research that um, Fiona and I have been doing as part of a preparation for this seminar, some pilot research that we hope to expand into a larger research study. So we've been interviewing key informants around women from Northern Ireland who travel um, for an abortion. Um, and I know Fiona is going to discuss this in more detail, but of particular concern to professionals were two themes coming through, the question of iniquity, um, unequal treatment of women within, um, in many ways, the same jurisdiction, and the question of citizenship. 
So the providers in Britain are very well aware that some women are having to pay for their abortion. These women are also taxpayers. Um, they're having to pay for their abortion when they travel over to Britain, and some women don't. And this is raised, again, very often um, as a very unequal treatment, and obviously it affects uh, poorer women disproportionately. Um, the other issue, and this was raised, this has been raised on a number of occasions, the other issue of particular concern to professionals, the, the key informants and stakeholders we interviewed, was women who were diagnosed with fatal fetal anomaly. And I know that this is a particular issue that is being debated at the moment. Um, and again, this is something that Fiona is going to speak about in a little bit more detail. But what I want to end up doing is just reading out the end of an interview that I had with one, um, one provider uh, before I hand over to Fiona. So when I, when I asked her if there's anything that she wanted to add to the interview before I um, said goodbye, she said, the thing that always strikes me about these women, she's talking about women with fatal fetal anomaly who travel um, to Britain for an abortion. The thing that always strikes me about these women is that they are faced with this awful dilemma. They have a planned pregnancy that hasn't turned out as expected, and they are dealing with the shock and upset of that. And then when they are looking for medical help, they find that they can't get that help and that people are not helpful. And they have to start making arrangements and talking to people about all this really emotional thing and trying to arrange flights and hotels. It just seems so awful that they have to face this other dilemma and come to England and have to terminate for a much wanted pregnancy away from home, away from the support of family. It always upsets me that they've got this one big problem and then it's added to. Okay, thank you. Okay, so my part of the presentation, I'm going to focus briefly on Ireland, the Republic of Ireland to start with, before considering in detail the Northern Ireland context. Um, and in terms of the legislation in the Republic of Ireland, abortion law, again, was historically governed by the 1861 Offences Against the Persons Act, a hangover from the country's time as part of the British Empire. Um, and in fact, this legislation remains in many other countries previously part of the British Empire, some of which would have been the areas highlighted in red in the map which, which Leslie had up. Uh, one of the countries, Sierra Leone, most recently, for instance, has decided to overturn the 1861 Act in Sierra Leone and has proposed revised legislation which is much more liberal. The impact of the 1861 Act in the Republic of Ireland and constitutional amendments have contributed to limited access to abortion in the Republic of Ireland, with on average about 30 legal abortions per year carried out um, in the country, whilst thousands more travel to England and elsewhere to access abortion. Several high-profile cases have resulted in the abortion debate being an almost continual focus of public attention in recent years. And whilst new legislation was introduced in 2013, this has not led to widened participation, and in fact the legislation has been subject to criticism from a number of quarters. If we look then at legislation in Northern Ireland, um, abortion here is also governed by the Offences Against the Persons Act of 1861. Um, case law uh, allows for abortion in limited circumstances. And the, the data shows that on average 39 abortions per year are carried out in Northern Ireland on the NHS. In contrast to that, an average of 1,075 travel to England to access abortion. And as Leslie's already said, those travelling to access abortion um, cannot access NHS services in England and instead have to pay private clinics. Others are thought to um, access the abortion pill from online providers, um, such as Women on Web and Women um, Help Women, and they self-abort at home. Uh, numbers are unknown as to the extent by which that actually happens. Moving on to look at what limited data we have then on NHS abortions. Um, the low numbers mean it's, it's difficult to actually look at trends over time. But in this table, you'll see this is data released by the Department of Health uh, just last week, and the most recent figures. It tracks back the uh, legal abortions carried out from 2006 
right through to 2014-15. And you'll see those numbers fluctuate, this last column here, from 57, and there's some fluctuation, and the last year of reported uh, period was 16 abortions carried out on the NHS. If you look at the age profile, um, the, the data, say, is limited, but you can see that most of those carried out were on um, individuals who were aged 30 and over. Um, what do we know then about the women who travel? And, and actually, we have a extensive data that profiles the women who travel. Um, abortion clinics in um, England are required to provide monitoring data to the Department of Health. Um, and we're going to look at some of those now and look at them over a 10-year period. Okay, so I'll, I'll explain the, the nice colour chart. Um, the, the orange, yellow and green colours are essentially teenage, the teenage years. So orange is under 16, um, the yellow is 16 to 17 and the green is 18 to 19. So if we look at those broadly across the 10 years, you'll see less than 20% in that time period are teenagers who are accessing abortion. The next level up is the blue and that's ages 20 to 24. And then the next level is 25 to 29, the black category. So if we take those two categories together, that's women in their 20s, on average that amounts to around 50% of those who travel are individuals in their 20s. The next level then, the purple colour, that's ages 30 to 34, and the next level up red is women aged 35 or over. So broadly speaking, most of those who are travelling are in their 20s, but there is a wide range there um, of those who are travelling. The next category then we're going to look at is the marital status of those who travel. Um, single, and that's the, the, the first category there in blue, generally speaking amount to between 30 and 40% of those who travel. Um, but the main category um, in the most recent years, has, in the green category, is those who are married in a civil partnership or with a partner. Um, I just want to point out too that the first two years in the reporting period, 2005-2006, this category was not collected on a consistent basis. So we can kind of discount those two years in terms of establishing a pattern. But the remaining years show the majority of those who travel are married um, in a civil partnership or with a partner. Moving on then, those who travel are asked what their, how do they identify in terms of their ethnicity. And again, if we discount the first two years when the data wasn't collected consistently, if we look at the years from 2007 to 2013, the blue category are those who um, self-identify as being white British, and the green category are those who identify as being white Irish. So they're the two main categories that are selected by those who travel, but the majority of those are those who identify as being white Irish. Um, and then in the next category, this focuses on the gestation, and that's um, the calculating the time in the pregnancy in weeks at which the abortion is carried out. And if you look at the, the, the abortions that are carried out over that 10-year period, the blue category there at the bottom, they're within the first um, the weeks between week three and week nine. Um, the green category is week 10 to 12. So taking those two categories together, you can see that 80 to 90% of all abortions carried out on women who travel are within the first 12 weeks of the pregnancy. Um, you can also see that the next categories, 13 to 19 weeks, are red, and the, the purple category is those who travel at the later gestation periods. Looking at some of the, the personal stories then about the women who travel, um, um, I want to focus on those cases with the later gestation times who are more likely to include those with the diagnosis of fatal fetal anomaly. And these are some of the cases that were highlighted by the, the stakeholders that we talked to. So you'll see there the first case is a couple who received a diagnosis of fatal fetal anomaly but could not tell their parents or anyone about the circumstances, about the, the need for an abortion. The couple had no money. Um, but were able to borrow £150, and the remainder of the costs for their travel and for the abortion um, were met by the charity Abortion Support Network. 
The second case then involved a couple um, who were pregnant with twins with fatal fetal anomaly um, and they needed support and you'll see there from the, the, auth the interview with the ASN staff they tried everything to receive care in Northern Ireland. They wanted to have a funeral for their babies. They wanted to bring their babies home for an autopsy so that they could be aware for future pregnancies. The couple were very young, and even though they had the support of families, they were barely able to raise 100 pounds. And again, Abortion Support Network provided the costs for the remainder of their travel costs and for the costs for um, the termination. Families who wish to have an autopsy or a burial um, after an abortion in England um, have to organise bringing the remains home um, to Northern Ireland. This might include using specialist services and that would be an additional cost of around £400. They might um, send the remains home using a parcel courier or bring the remains home in their hand luggage if they're flying or um, in their car if they're travelling by ferry. And as highlighted in the case, in the briefing notes that you have in front of you, the pathways to obtaining an, abor uh, obtaining an autopsy are unclear. Um, the third case, which is uh, detailed in your briefing notes, uh, relates the story of a young couple seeking an autopsy after they had travelled to England for an, ab an abortion on the grounds of fatal fetal anomaly. This was, um, the autopsy was arranged via the clinic in England to take place at a hospital in Belfast. The young couple carried the fetal remains in their luggage, in their hand luggage. Their flight, unfortunately, arrived back in Belfast after the autopsy office had closed. The abortion clinic staff then had to contact the, Belfast, the hospital in Belfast to find out where the couple could go to bring the fetal remains um, in order to facilitate the autopsy. And you'll see there that a member of the clinic staff took the responsibility of organising that in terms of where the fetal remains could be left. Um, and she relates how she was passed around several departments in the hospital uh, before she spoke to a midwife who suggested that the couple could bring the fetal remains to the labour ward and leave them there. The clinic staff in England pointed out that that was perhaps insensitive to ask the young couple to do that and suggested an alternative meeting point. The absence of pathways to autopsy um, and tests uh, for fetal remains, um, some have argued, relate to the issue of guidelines for medical staff. Um, since 2001, the Family Planning Association um, have argued to, uh, for, that the Department of Health should provide guidelines for medical staff to assist them in interpreting the law on a consistent basis. The first version of the guidelines was issued in 2007. It, since then, the guidelines have been withdrawn and reissued on several occasions. And currently, as we speak, there are no guidelines available for medical staff. The Family Planning Association argue that the lack of guidelines impacts on access and contributes to individuals seeking abortions outside of Northern Ireland. Moving on then to reflect on what are the current debates in terms of legislative reform. The law on abortion on, in Northern Ireland is regarded as vague and along with factors such as anti-abortion discourse and stigma results in restricted access. The absence of guidelines for medical staff has resulted in the denial of, of abortion under legal circumstances. The draft guidelines issued in 2013 were widely criticised by health professionals and were subsequently linked to the denial of abortions on the ground of fatal fetal anomaly. These particular cases later triggered a proposed legal reform by the Department of Justice, which recommended allowing abortion on grounds of fatal fetal anomaly. This uh, DOJ position was then subject to legal challenge in the form of a judicial review, which concluded that abortion should be permitted on the grounds of fatal fetal abnormality as well as rape and incest. The judge argued that having to travel caused additional stress to individuals in these circumstances and also highlighted that women from poorer backgrounds uh, were subject to additional barriers. The judicial review has since been appealed, as we've already heard, by both the Department of Justice and the Attorney General. In a study currently underway, which is funded by the British Academy, myself and a colleague, Claire Pearson, are considering the nature of the political debate on abortion in Northern Ireland. 
Since its inception in 1998 until 2014, the Assembly has held four major debates on abortion. These sessions have centred either on the issue of legal reform or on the guidelines. The use of evidence is largely absent from these debates, and instead they exhibit examples of abortion myths and make reference to women in vulnerable situations um, and that these women need protection. Very few contributions in these debates demonstrate understanding of the complex reasons why improved access to abortion is needed. To conclude then. The data considered here, and in particular in the pilot study, indicates that there is evidence for the need to improve access to abortion. We note that legal action has been taken to improve access, though this will likely impact on only a small number of cases. The current law places a particular burden on those from low incomes who have to fund the travel costs and other costs alongside the abortion costs themselves if they travel outside of Northern Ireland. And we finally conclude that Northern Ireland presents at a classic case of the restrictions on abortion, not halting abortion, but displacing it to another jurisdiction and contributing to abortions being conducted away from a healthcare setting. To move forward, we argue that research should inform assessing access to a knowledge of contraception, provision of training for health professionals, guidance for health professionals, legal reform and programmes to challenge stigma.